It's my pleasure to introduce Jerry Heaton, a member of the Central Kentucky Computer Society. Jerry will be sharing with us today word tips and tricks. Jerry's been a member of the Central Kentucky Computer Society for 28 years, and 12 of those years he led a word processing special interest group, a SIG, during which time more than 2,000 members signed in to attend his sessions. He once wrote a book, Jerry's Guide to Better Word Processing, which is now totally out of date with all the changes that have taken place. Jerry has been teaching over Zoom this past year and tells us that he learns as much from his students as they probably do from him. In addition to his tips and tricks using the latest version of Word, he will also share with us some useful Word projects that you may want to do. I now turn over the presentation to Jerry. Okay, uh, I'm, uh, I appreciate it. Those that are here and going to stay with me, I appreciate you all being a part of this program. And I will uh, provide you some information about some new things or maybe not so new things in word processing. And then I've got a, a couple of projects that I'm going to show you that I think you will be interested in using. And one of them is urgent that you use. So let's get started by showing this. Uh, first off, my name is Jerry Heaton, and uh, that's me. Uh, I'm standing next to Thomas Edison, and he's trying to emulate my position and posture. Uh, that's taken some time ago. At any rate, that's me if you wonder what I look like. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about some new tools offered, or maybe I should say newer tools that are offered uh, Microsoft Word because some of them have been around a while, but I'll be showing a lot of things as I go along as to the way I edit a document, and therefore you may find something that you hadn't known before. The Also, as was, suggest, as was mentioned, I'm going to suggest a couple of projects you may want to create and use. Those projects are the newer features of Word, which is what I'm going to concentrate on, is Diptape, which once was called speech recognition. It's really not new. It's been around about 25 years. The earlier versions weren't worth anything because you spent more time editing and correcting the mistakes it made. The new Diptape, though, is much, much improved. And it's available and it works with Word, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Outlook, and Microsoft PowerPoint. The second thing I'll be talking about is the editor program, and uh, it is uh, mainly concentrated on the use in Word. So let's get started. It's time for a demo, so that means I need to bring up a Word, new Word document. And here it is. Um, all right, the two things I'm going to talk about are up here in the, let me move this part. I don't know if I can, okay. Okay, the two things I'm going to talk about are these two in the right hand corner, dictate and editor, and I'm going to demonstrate and talk about those. First thing I'll do is I'm going to hold down the control key and use the mouse wheel in order to create the sides, increase the size of the page so that you all will be able to see it much better. And then of course I'll go up here and that at this point, uh, I will be increasing this to a larger type style down here. But there's two ways to do that. Let's do it this way. If I hold down the control and shift key and press the greater than carrot, uh, then you notice that 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. Okay, that ought to be enough. Let's go back to 20. 20 ought to be plenty. I don't want to make it too big. I'm going the wrong way. There's 20. Okay, so now I've got it ready. Now let me share with you this. Dictate the best way in dictating to a computer is to not concentrate so much on what it is 
putting on the screen. The whole idea is to get a lot of information on the screen quickly without having to sit here and pound the keyboard. So what I'm going to do is just dictate a paragraph or two or three, and we'll see how well it does. And you can decide for yourself whether this is worth anything to you. Now, they have done something new. Uh, i am got the latest version of Word here. Uh, I am a member of the Microsoft 365 program. I pay an annual fee for that. So I get update versions of all the Microsoft programs, whether I'm ready for them or not. For example, uh, in this area down here on the screen where I'm wiggling my mouse now, uh, if you can see that, uh, down in this area will show up whenever I click on the dictate button up here, a, something that showed up only 10 days ago, and it's a, it's a uh, dialogue box that's right in the way of what I'm typing. And I don't know whose idea that was, but it shows up there. The first thing I need to do every time is to move it either up to the top of the screen or if you've got a second screen, I sometimes tuck it away over on my second monitor. So here we go, let's give this a try and we'll see I'm going to tell you something about the Computer Society in Lexington. Here we go. The Central Kentucky Computer Society is located in Lexington, Kentucky. I've been a member there for 28 years and I've volunteered to do several jobs for that organization. I actually work I actually enjoy my work, and that needs to be the case since I don't get paid anything, as most of you all are familiar with that kind of an operation. New paragraph. I taught word processing there on and off for a total of 12 years, and I've now served as an editor of their newsletter for 10 years. CKCS has been at our present location for 13 years. We have a small amount of space for an office supervisor where, who is on duty for six hours on a typical day, whenever we're open, which is not, the last, not so much in the last year. And uh, we have a workshop room where 50 can attend a SIG seminar workshop presentation using comfortable seating, being comfortably seated in office type armchairs. A small room, which we call the classroom, contains 18 computers and allows system students hands-on experience with PC and Apple programs. Okay, now I have turned that off and you turn this on and off up here where I'm where the pointer is right now. Um, and the that dialogue box, which I tucked away on another screen, has a couple of tools which could have easily been a drop-down box on the dictate box, but uh, they didn't do it that way. I hope they do sometimes. Let's see how this turned out. Well, the first thing I spot is that it didn't capitalize the name of the society. So I will highlight that and then control and, and, and I'll use the shift key, excuse me. I'll hold down the shift key and the F3 key one time and see what happens. Well, it capitalized everything. I've still got the shift key held down. I'm going to touch the F3 key again. It goes to all lowercase, and then again, it becomes all title case. I do this a lot rather than actually deleting and retyping or substituting just the first letter of each word one at a time, trying to capitalize something. Okay, I said um, it's located right there. Remember, 28 years, I volunteered in several jobs for that organization. That should be a period here. I didn't say period, did I? Should have, I actually work. I, I made an error here, didn't I? I actually uh, enjoy. 
Okay, that's done. And let's see, what else do I need to do? I stumbled a few times. Oh, word processing. I'm not going to correct this right now, but word processing is a single word here, and it's not supposed to be. Let's see what else we've got here. Okay, 50 can attend a SIG. That should be S-I-G, right? Click, click, double click, and it highlighted the whole word, S-I-G. Okay, seminar, workshop, presentation, seminar, it should be comma. Should have said that, I did, guess. Workshop. Okay, using comfortable seating and being comfortably seated. Uh, let's do this. Again, I stumbled. Undo. Where was I? Using, I should say being. Okay, delete that. So you see, I have to do some editing to get things the way I really wanted them to be. Okay, there's some things that are not corrected here. And so I'm going to use the second feature that I was going to talk about, and that is this editor. So I'll click on editor and it will analyze the entire text of what I've done and in seconds identify any problems that there is in various fields of editing. Here we go. Well, it only found three. One spelling error. So if I want to find spelling, I just click on spelling and it goes to word processing and it tells me word processing should be a two words. So all I have to do to correct that is to click on the two words. Now there are two more correct. Well, spelling is okay now. Uh, the next thing is conciseness. Okay. Uh, it's looking at is located in Lexington, Kentucky. And it's saying, forget the word located. And so I'll accept that. And it took that out. I actually enjoy, she's there suggesting that I forget the word actually. So I'll just cl click on that and that's correct. And then this is the last thing. Uh, do not, they, they don't, they challenge every contraction. Apostrophe yes, don't, can't, won't. All of those will be challenged because they want you to actually say, instead of don't, they want do not. So I'll go along with them. And I've, here's another contraction. I have, I'll go along with it. And so now there are no corrections and the editor has gone over my whole document. The only thing I need to do one more time probably before I actually accept this. Okay, I'm finished. Let's close this. I'd have to read this one more time because anytime you dictate something, if you haven't uh, looked at it several times, you'll find that you, there's a word in there you didn't mean or a phrase in there that was left that uh, you, you just got to be careful because you'll be embarrassed by it later. You didn't, most of the time, I always spot these right after I press send and it's gone somewhere and then I have to worry about it. Okay, well, that's, that's a sample of both the dictate program and the editor program. Let's look at the editor. Jerry, before you go on, yes. does, are those two icons always there? Yes, they are. Thank you. Uh, on my version, I, I don't know how many other people uh, have those, but uh, on my version, yes, they're both there. And of course, this is part of, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's part of Office 365. I do pay, uh, if you do I the whole package, you pay about $99 a year. I think this is a $79 version that doesn't use uh, access, which is the, which is the file uh, program. Uh, at any rate, uh, these are up there. Yes. All right. I love them. I, as you will discover, I use them all the time. Uh, 
and they, like I say, it's gotten better. You used to have to train speech recognition by reading text and it would learn your dialect. This was just done. I mean, it just showed up and it works for me. Of course, I've got a terrible Kentucky accent and, and uh, other people point that out to me every now and then, but it seems to understand Kentucky accent and it might even uh, recognize an Indiana accent. Uh, accent, who knows? <laughs> How about that, John? <laughs> okay, well, that's an example of that one. Let's get rid of that. I'm going to close this out. And I don't need to save that, no. And let me bring up something new. Uh, I, as part of my work at the Society 15 years ago, I took on my, took on the job of, uh, doing a history of the Central Kentucky Computer Society. And uh, I wrote this a long time ago. That's been updated once, and that's why the September the 2017th date is there. It's probably a lot older than that. But let's just, for the first time, let's just let the editor program look at this and see what it thinks. So it's going to, uh, I've only got four pages here. I wrote probably 18 pages about this about the society's history. So here we go. Um, all right, it found 15 errors. Let's look at the spelling errors first. Click. The first one, well, this is a person's name. Paulson, okay, he was editor or something like that. Okay, I want to ignore that once. So right down here is ignored once down at the bottom. It says ignore once, and I'm going to accept that. Well, here's another name. Same thing. I'm not. I'm going to ignore them because there's nothing. And Compulex is a name. We ran a for eight years. We ran a um, a, a, a trade show at Rupp Arena in Lexington. One time we had six thousand people pay to go into that. We had booths and everything, uh, exhibitors and so forth. But at any rate, it, uh, Compulex was the name of that particular thing. We did that for eight years. So it's a proper name, and it's spelled correctly, so I will ignore that once also. All right, the next thing we're going to look at is grammar. Let's look at what it thinks about grammar. Well, the first thing, record-breaking. Oh, I see what's wrong. They want to put a hyphen. So to do, put the hyphen there, all I had to do is press enter right where the pointer is. And it goes to the next one. Well, oh, this has an extra space in it. That's what the problem is there. So in order to correct that, all I had to do is put, click there. Now, well-known, uh, well-known, oh, I see it's, oh, they were wanting hyphenation. And the next, we got four more grammar items. What's that? Uh, Question and answer. Oh, they want hyphens in between them. Question and answer. I'll go along with it, okay. He ran this out of his home. What the, wants a comma after that? Okay, and members have written to share with other members. That should be of the organization anyway, but uh, I'm not going to bother to change that right now. Well, I will. Let's do it. Of the organization that should have been. But, and I don't think we, therefore, ignored that. Okay. Resume grammar. And he's got a space with a comma. Let's go on with that. And they went back to provide members access. Yeah, that's apostrophe. That's correct. Now, let's see what else we got. Formality. Were not. Again, they hate contractions. So we correct that. Weren't. Were not. Okay. And we've got punctuation. Con What's this? Auditorium. I'll need a comma after that. An incorporated period. 
Oh, it wants a comma after that too? I didn't know that. Okay. All right. So I'm now through and there are no, I've corrected the errors on four pages. Now, this is something we put on a web page years ago. All of these corrections probably should may be made on the entire document and send it back and put it back on the uh, website again because it just resides there for someone who wants to find out about the history of the organization. All right, now you've gotten a demonstration of the dictate. It works pretty good, I accept it, and I use it quite a bit. The editor, I use it more now that I've found out how well it um, edits a document and makes it a better document than probably, uh, probably I did. By the way, I did a, uh, my, my daughter insisted that I do a autobiography someday. So I finally got busy when the pandemic kept me in and, st and I stayed inside for long periods of time. And I wrote a 170 some pages about my life as a kid. And uh, then I said, well, I'll give you that as a PDF. Nope, she didn't want that. She wanted me to print it as a book. So I did. I'd hate to put that book and run the editor on it. I wish I had the editor back when I did this back a year ago, but editor is new and I really like what it does and I would probably follow a lot of the directions. Now, if you all have questions about what I've shown you so far, of course, he's told you about looking at the chat button at the bottom of the screen and you can ask a question and I'll try to have time to do that uh, later. Okay. This was a demonstration of that part of this. Now I've got two projects. One's a nice to do project and one's a must to do project. I'm going to close this down, don't say. Okay, and let's, let's continue on here. When people do us a favor, and you uh, get ready to leave or leave them or they're about ready to leave, you usually just say, thanks. Thanks for helping me. Someone uh, comes over and picks you up and takes you somewhere as a favor, uh, you always say, thanks. Someone says, come over and have a meal. And they fix a nice meal for you. As you walk out the door, you say, thank you. Well, in the old days, Emily Post would be suggesting that it be appropriate to write a note and send it to them in an envelope and to say thank you and really make it. When you do that, it really carries impact more than just saying thanks as you walk out the door. So we need to do more of that. And I've got a way to do some of that. And this is what I want to ask you. What if there was a different type of email to say thank you. And what if it was different enough to really catch the eye of the recipient's attention, catch the recipient's attention? And what about if it's quick and easy to do? I've got something just like that, and I'm going to show you one that I'm going to make right in front of you here. Uh, and uh, it's going to look something like this when I finish. It's time for a demo though. You know, there is a bar here that normally is across the bottom. I don't know how to move it. Oh, it's moving now. There we are. I'll get it down a little bit. Okay. I was going to ask you how to do that, John, but uh, we'll go ahead now. All right. The first thing I need to do is open a Word document. And this is what I'm going to, I'll open a blank document. And this is what I'm going to suggest we do. First, I'll just take, I've got the show hide feature turned on, which puts, puts a, a, a paragraph mark every place where there's been an enter key pushed. And I'm pushing some enter keys to get several keys down in a row here. Um, and then I'm going to start about the third one down here. And I'm going to type the words, thank you. And, but I want these to be big words and I want them to be in the middle of the page. So 
uh, I'll highlight them. Hold down the shift and control key and use the arrow key to highlight those two. And I want to make those big and bold. So I go find me something in a larger, stronger type. And it so happened since I've used this recently, it's close to the top rather than being alphabetically in the list. So Cooper Black is what I'm going to use and it makes this strong. And I want to center it. So I center it by control plus E. And that centers it on the screen. Now I want it bigger than that. Uh, I'm going to suggest 28 point. Well, you see 12 point is up here. 12 point up here. Watch this. I control shift and I go to 28 point. I do it with a keyboard shortcut. I also would like that to be green. So this is where you select under font. This is where you select your colors and your color of your type. And you can make it any color you want, but I want it to be green. And if I go all the way to the bottom, it's almost black. So I'm going back off just a little bit to make it next to the bottom. And so it says, thank you now. Now down at the bottom, I'm going to, down to the bottom, I want to, we would want to personalize this just for you. So we would put uh, your name, comma, your address, comma, city, comma, state, comma, zip, comma, phone number. I just turned it off and I get rid of this dumb thing that should not have shown up anyway. Okay. So now this, of course, I want this pretty small. So I'm going to change this down to about nine point. And I'm going to center it. Control plus E centers it. Of course, I could have gone up here and used this. This is also a center mark. But it tells you that the sh keyboard shortcut is Control plus E. I love keyboard shortcuts. You probably figured that out already. All right, now this is going to be in black. Uh, it uh, could be in all caps. If you wanted it in all caps, then Shift plus F3 would make it all caps. Or if you don't want it, first letter of each word. At any rate, that would be what you type in here with your information. Now, this part in the middle, I want this to be uh, in a handwriting font. And there is such a thing up here. If you dig down into it, you will find, and I've used it recently, so it's at the top of my list, Lucida handwriting. And I click that because I wanted that. And I want this to be larger because... Uh, I want, uh, I'm going to make it 16 points. I'll just do it this way this time, 16 points. Now that is all set up and, and uh, let me just show you. It will look like this whenever I finish, period. You can see that it's like handwriting. And I kind of like that. It's a nice uh, finish, nice touch. Okay, I'm going to delete that. And I'm going to get rid of this again. <sighs> okay, another thing I need to do is highlight the whole thing. Control A. Well, let's make it, let's, let's uh, make it so you can see the whole thing. Highlight the whole thing. Control A highlights everything. And I'm going to put a border around it. Well, the border's up here under paragraph. And if I hold, if I look on this little down arrow and click on it, I can get any of these things that I want. Well, I want all outside borders. And that's it. And I'd also like that to be bolder than that. 
So I now go up here again to borders and find down at the very bottom is borders and shading. So at this point, I'm going to say, let's make it a bolder line. And here's, I've got one half point. It's going to be, let's make it three points. And uh, I wanted the same color as the type. So let's do that. And I say, okay. And that's, that gives me a basic form to work with now. Uh, one other thing left to do. I've got, I've got this in green. I've got the border in green. This is going to be in black. This is also going to be black, top, black uh, printing, but it'll look nice. And it's a larger size. I did make it the right size. Yeah, it's 16 point. Yes, I did. And so everything's set the way I want except for one thing. I think it'd be nice if this were colored. So I'm going to, since this is going to be an email and no one's going to be printing it out, we're not going to waste a lot of ink. Uh, let's, let's fill the space in the middle, use the fill, this little bucket here. And I click on it. And again, I want to pick out a color that I like. Well, oh, I need to highlight the whole thing. Excuse me. I forgot. I like the whole thing. Control A. Now everything's highlighted. Now let's get to fill with the color. Well, I don't want black. I don't think I want blue. Well, how about this? I like that. Let's make it a little lighter. Now, that's going to look like a page that came out of an envelope. So, this is the basic document. Now, what I would do before I type a thank you note to anyone, I would save this in Word as a template. Google tells you how to create a template, and it's fairly simple. But I'm not going to take time to do it. I've already done it. So let me just show you that if I had already saved this, or if I did save this as a template, this is what I would do to get a new one. I would go down here to uh, I would open up Word. Well, let's get a new document. Having tool. Let me get to it. Here we go. And now I've opened up Word. And instead of clicking on a blank new document, I'm going to click on new. Because this is where my templates are. Now I've done this previously, and that's a class thank you sample is what it's called. So I'm going to click on that, and it immediately opens up what basically I completed earlier. Well, I see it's something I don't really like. This is too, too uh, far up. I'd like to, I, I would actually change that so that on future, when I open this up, this would be this size. Okay. Now I'm ready to do a thank, thank you note. And all I had to do, let's say I needed to write a note to my daughter who gave me a helping hand. And I'm going to say, uh, Dear Sarah, new paragraph. Thank you so much for your help last week, period. You saved me a lot of time and trouble, and for that I am very grateful, period. New paragraph. For all you've done, I would like to treat you to a nice meal somewhere, comma. So you pick the date and the let me know when and where. New paragraph. Love to you. New paragraph. Jerry. Once again, this dumb box is in the way. I'd like to tell that person that that was a stupid idea. Okay. All right. There you are. I've got pretty much what I want. I. I'm assuming the text was right. I may have stumbled on it. Date and time, let me know. It looks pretty, pretty close to right. And I would check it to make sure it's exactly what I wanted it to be, by the way. And by the way, I forgot to do this on the other one. I put a, a tab right in the middle, a standard tab. 
and I would put that there so that whenever I came over here, love to you could be in the middle and my name could be over in the middle. Now, this is about what I would like for it to be. This is, well, this is a little longer than I wanted to. I would probably forgot to do this. I would, uh, I would need to delete some of these. I just want to make it in proportion is what I'm trying to do. I've got it about the way I want it. Now that I've got it the way I want it, the letter is ready to go to an email. Now I want to go, want it to be a photo, a picture. I could do that by going down here to this snipping tool, clicking on snipping tool, copy it, and then move it over to an email in the text area of an email. But there's another way to do that. If I click on it and click all, select all, control A, and I have copied it to my clipboard now. So now I'm going to open up my email. And that is here. This is Outlook. Well, it opened up over here in the second screen. Let me bring it over. And I'm going to start a new email. Now, I, I, while well, I've got it open, let's go make it full. And I'm going to click down in here into the text area. And I'm going to paste it there. But rather than just click paste, I'll show you what I need to do. I need to go down here to the down arrow and click on it. And if I just pasted it, this is what it would look like. Did it not copy that? Wait a second. <laughs> it didn't copy my original. Let me go back and get it. I thought it did. All right, let's minimize this. I thought I clicked on it in control C. All right, that should be in my clipboard. I'll look up here and see. Yep, it's there. Okay, it's there this time. All right, now let's go back. I'll excuse me for having to divert. But now I'm going to click there and I'm going to go up here to the paste, the down arrow, and I'm going to go if I sit if I pasted it, it'd be huge like this. Well, that wouldn't look very good. But if I made it like a picture, it would be smaller like this. And this is what it would look like. I'll have to minimize it so you can see it. But let's make it a little larger. And I'm going to uh, center that. I want that to be centered. So control E again, moves it to the middle. And here is what would go with this letter. I'd put my email address for my daughter here. I'd probably just say thank you or special thanks or something a little different than what's in the letter. And then I'd send it. Now, this looks like a, a piece of stationery almost that's been pasted into your email. It's better. And although Emily Post probably would not approve it, but this is the way we communicate most of the time now. So that being the case, this is what I'm suggesting that you might consider doing. Okay, I'm spending way too much time on this. So I hope uh, if you have any questions, you'll put that in the uh, chat box. That shows you what I had in mind. Because I'm running way late. I don't know why, but I am. No, I don't want to save this. And close this. No, I don't want to save that either. And I don't need to save this. I'll just close it. Don't save. Okay. Now, I'm ready to change uh, PowerPoints. And I'm just going to have to scan over this because we're already at 242. How close do I have to be, uh, John? I've only got eight minutes to go. I have about 10 oh, minutes. I, I, I can stick around for a while. Everybody's liking it. Well, <laughs> I'm surprised, but we'll see. At any rate, I'm going to offer that 
to you all in a, in, as an attachment to an email in just a minute. But let me get this one going, and I'll, I'll run through this one really quick. Okay, slideshow from the beginning. All right, now let, let me give you a little bit of a story here, and I'm going to try to make it quick. Once, and when I was in a city visiting my sister, the local newspaper carried a story about this newsletter, the news person, the news reporter, reported that the story went this way. His mother had died a few months before, and just recently he father, his father passed away. Well, he's a, one of the, the only son, and he visited his parents every Christmas, maybe, maybe one more time each year, very much just for a day, and really did not know much about what they did all day or what they did and how they lived. But all of a sudden, he became the executor of the estate. And he, the, the gist of the story was, gee, he needed to know more about his parents. I had wished he'd ask a hundred questions as an executor, things that he needed to know. And then he concluded at the end of the article that, gee, I wish my dad had written down a lot of the things that I just need to know about how they live and where things are, because he was really struggling and it was going to take him a ton of time to get the job done. So this caused me to do something. I started what I called a death data document. And my document started out very small as I look up and think about things. Later on, I would add more to it. My document now is 36 pages long, but it covers everything about me that my two children need to know about in order to close out and finish the estate once I'm gone. So that's what this is about. It's called a death data document. Maybe sounds gruesome to you, but you can call it anything you want, it, want to call it. But I call mine a death data document. And here's some of the, just real quickly, I'm going to go through some of these topics. I introduced it by telling them why I started it and when I started it. And then every time I go and update it, I put a note up there that I, up, I updated this on so-and-so date. Still, they need to know when I started. And then, they, then I start telling them where I keep important papers, such as a fireproof safe, such as filing cabinets, and other places where I might have them. What is my social security number? That's something they need to know when dealing with the funeral home and so forth. A birth certificate. Do I have a birth certificate? Where is it? Specifically, where is that person? Do I have a will? Who are my witnesses? Are they alive? Uh, where is the will? Uh, and that sort of thing. Did, you, did I write an obituary? Well, a matter of fact, in my death data document, I have written my what I think would be a decent obituary. My brother-in-law died 20 years ago. My sister worked real hard and made an effort to write a good obituary, and I'm sure she did a fine job. But about five years later, she was going through some files, and here my brother-in-law had written his own obituary, and it was a better one and more complete than what my sister had done. So what a shame if she had just known that this was here and where to look. But here's a mother, mother, here's a, a wife and a husband living in the same place, but they don't know what everything is going on, what each of them have done. So this says to me, and I might say right now, one of these needs to be done by both the, the spouse and the, uh, well, both spouses needs to do this. They need to do, the, do one of these. And in my case, I'm single, so therefore my two children need to know all the stuff I've got here. Uh, what funeral arrangements have I made? And ours is paid for? And where was it? What did I have in mind? Uh, do I have a burial plot? 
where if it's there if i have one where is it where's the deed on that that block by the way house what about the house where is the deed which is needed of course you can always go to the court but that's a a several hour process to get a duplicate deed uh but if you needed it you'd have to he'd have to do that the uh, the the executor has to do that sort of thing. So, in other words, where's the deed? Do I own any other real estate? You need to be, if that's the case, you need to mention it. How about the car and all the papers? What if they want to sell the car? Uh, you know, uh, we've got to do something about it. What bank accounts do you have and where are they? What bank? Do you have a bank lockbox? By the way, where's the key to the lockbox? The reason you need to know that, when you close out the bank box without the key, it's $150 fee to close out the box without a key. What a shame to waste money. I hate to waste money. What about savings accounts? Do you have any of those? What about debts? Do you owe anything? What are your debts? And if so, outline them. Bank debit cards. Do you have one? What's the card number? How do I close that card out? That needs to be in this document. What's on the back of the card needs to be in the document. The numbers to call. What about store charge cards and credit cards? The numbers of the card need to be in this document along with the information of how to cancel the card. Because what happens if you die away from home and your wallet's missing? Well, then you've got a lost wallet problem and there's these companies need to be notified. Uh, the bottom one being, it's behind something here, the broad line. I don't know if you all see that bar that's across the bottom, but it's covering my, my screen right here. The social security number fraud line is the last one. And uh, let's see, more topics. Investments, what investments do you have? How about the keys to the house and the keys to the other key to the car, the second key to the car? Normally not kept in the car, of course, and not out in the open normally. So you need to know that. That's $150 or $125 to get another one of those. What about odd keys? Do you have any keys that belong to someone else's house? I do. Well, you need to. I now have a key rack and every key on my rack is identified as to what that key is. It's not a surprise to anyone. About combination locks. Yeah, they only cost $15, $20, but they're useless unless you know the combination. So if you have a combination lock, what is the combination? Why not put it in here? Do you have a property survey? And if so, where is it? What about insurance college policies? My dad died a whole bunch of years ago. About 10 years went by, my mother uh, got a phone call. And the man says, uh, this is Joe Doak's house, Mr. Eaton doing? And she said, well, he died 10 years ago. Well, I'm with so-and-so insurance company. Mr. Eaton had a policy with us. So I need to pay you the amount of that policy. Of course, she didn't know that he had that policy. And that's another thing. Do you have any insurance policies and where are they? And who are they with? And who do you contact? All of this kind of information needs to be in this document. What about hidden money? When you get cash to it, $200 at the bank, what do you do with the money that you're not going to carry in your pocket? Do you hide it somewhere? Well, if you do, wouldn't it be a shame if your kids take and sell a couch for $200 that has $500 hidden in it somewhere? Well, that's the sort of thing that you need to cover. Retirement funds, of course, most of them end, but you need to discuss all those kinds of things. And what about passwords to get in the computer? And uh, what passwords do you use uh, for other items? And uh, four-digit pins is something that need to be discussed. These... There's many more things that could be covered, but I, uh, I, I'm not going to try to go over all of them. Other than, well, here's tickets, for example. Do you have any season tickets to football, basketball, or baseball or th that are not used? 
It's a shame to just let them sit there and go out of out of not be used. Give them to someone or sell them to someone. Uh, now this this is just a partial list that of of what what's out there. Just a partial list, but this is something everyone needs to do. But the children themselves don't need to have this document in advance. In fact, my kids have never seen my. 37, 36 page document yet. They know about it. We've talked about it not once, not twice, probably six or seven times, about every year or two. I set them down and we talk about some things, things just like this. This is, if they have questions, that's fine. I'll answer them right then. But they know that I've got this document out there and I don't want, I thought I used to keep it in the computer. And that, then it became complicated. What if they can't get into my computer? What if I change the password? Stuff like that. That would not work. So this is my solution. They don't need to know what the document now, but they do need to know about the document and how to get information from it. And this is what my suggestion is. For each of my children, I have a flash drive with their name on it. It's in a folder. And in the file card and in, in the file drawer uh, with their name on it. And so therefore, they know that on my death, they're supposed to come into the house and get this flash drive and take it to their own computer and plug it in. Now, anytime I update my document, I make it a point to update each of the flash drives for the kids. I've only got two in my case. So I've got two flash drives and I keep that up to date. Of course, the master document is behind a computer and under a password. It's in my, my machine. And so that's what I've done. So that's what I'm recommending each of you do. Now, I'm offering to you the following things. If you send me an email, and this will be the simplest thing, using this address, jerheat at gmail.com, and put in the subject line, ddoc, I'll send you a guide of how to prepare and all the topics with a discussion about each of the topics, some things you might want to think about. If you like the thank you note, saving you having to create it, I'll send you a form thank you note with the color and all of that already to become a template in your computer. And you take my thank you note, put it in your computer after you have updated the bottom line, which has name, address, and all that sort of stuff for you. Now, I'll assure you it only takes about five minutes to write a thank you note, but I've gotten into the habit when someone invites me out to dinner, I send them a thank you note by email now. I did three this last week. People did me a favor. And I, I just look for an excuse to use them. And I think people are impressed with my thank you note. If you want the thank you note, put in the subject line, TU note, or inside. You can actually write more information if you want. But those items there, if you have DD doc. TU note, I will send you both. There will be a single attachment for each one, and you can open it and it'll be ready to use by you. Ladies and gentlemen, I've covered what I thought I would cover. Uh, it took me six minutes longer than I wanted to, but uh, at any rate, we are where we should be. And John, if there are any one or two questions, I might try to handle them now. Good. A lot of the stuff will be sent into the uh, to Judy, and she'll send to you for comments by you, and then we'll send them out. But uh, I think that we need to leave with the question or the answer. We have a attendee who has the Home Office Business 2019 version of Word. They don't have that nifty um, dictate and edit. How do they get it? Well, there's a long pause because I can't explain that. Um, 2019 is one of the latest versions. 
Um, I, I, I can't explain that. I don't know. Well, uh, I, I guess that what I was trying to ta uh, toss at you was that it's probably features that are found in Office 365. So you want all the newest features. They want you to buy a subscription to 365. Of course. So uh, you <laughs> it's all about money, folks. I'm sorry, but that's just it. But I I'm an uh, I'm a Microsoft person. So therefore, I I've always used their products for 30 years. I've been at it. And I've used their products, and, and whenever they started with the 365, I thought, I, I don't want to pay for that. You know, we used to, you want a new version of Word, you go to the store and you buy a disk and take it home and plug it in your machine when you're ready, and you update your version of whatever product you've got. It doesn't work that way anymore. And just like they make changes just automatically, like that dialogue box that shows up right in the middle of the text when you hit uh, dictate. It irritates fire out of me. I am going to figure out a way to write the, by the way, in having, uh, having uh, Microsoft 365, it's called, when you have Microsoft 365, uh, you have a phone number of a helpline. And it's answered usually within four or five minutes and they will work with you to answer any question. I can, I've often thought I ought to call that number and say, I hate that dialogue box that someone <laughs> added. Get that thing out of here. But it also, if I had, if I said, I want uh, the dictate and uh, edit, uh, uh, dictate and uh, yeah, uh, edit uh, features, uh, they ought to be able to tell you what you need to do to get that. And I can't explain why it's not in the 2019 version of, that you have. Someone has. Yeah. Uh, somebody made a comment, and you might jump on that, that maybe it's something that in the uh, customizing of the ribbon, it needs to be activated to show on the ribbon um, if it's not something used a lot. Well, let me mention this. It didn't, um, I didn't ask for it. It's one of those things that all of a sudden in a normal update that occurs a lot more times than I think about. I mean, sometimes updates occur without me thinking about it and without me saying, okay, let's do it now. Uh, some of them, they do ask you to do that if it's a major update, but they'll make minor changes all the time. And I noticed that uh, it makes it difficult for a person like me who tries to teach you how to do certain shortcuts because the way I do a shortcut today may not be true tomorrow. It might be different. I wish they wouldn't do that sort of stuff too quickly uh, without no, I mean, you just discover they're there. There's no instruction about how you do it. You just have to sort of study it and work at it and learn it. And it makes it a challenge, doesn't it? Yeah. I'm not telling you anything new. Uh, is, is there any other particular question that might help? We're right at three o'clock. Yeah. I had somebody say that a Google search kind of indicates that it's something that's 365 and not part of 2019. Just have to go into all your menus and stuff like that. 